Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, second day of our spring meeting for the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. Uh, my name is Caroline Bell. I am the um, program officer from the National Academies leading um, this Standing Committee, along with um, our co-chair, um, who will be joining the Zoom link shortly. I misspoke. I said co-chair or with our chair. You can. Oh, you want me to? Sure. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm trying to get on myself. Uh, my name is Jim Sankirko, and I will officially introduce myself as the committee does in a couple slides. But welcome to the third meeting of the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind and Energy and Fisheries. As we get started, um, first, I'd just like to go through um, some expectations of conduct um, and uh, ask that uh, here uh, during our National Academies meetings that we um, leave the space open um, and, and invite everyone to have an, an open and um, uh, meeting where there's no harm to discrimination. <laughs> Fully. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. Um, you can click, uh, see the link at the bottom of the page to go to the National Academy's policy on preventing discrimination, um, harassment, and bullying. The National Academies of Science, just a little bit of background. We are a nonprofit independent uh, organization. We're not part of the federal government. Um, we're not an, an advocacy organization. Um, so some of you, um, if you weren't on yesterday, I'll go through a little bit of details about what exactly a standing committee is. This is one of our activities at the National Academies um, where we are a continuing activity with a, in this case, narrow focus looking at offshore wind energy and fisheries sponsored by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, or BOM. The committee is uh, organized to serve for an independent period of time um, to anticipate anticipating the sponsor's need for continuing information um, at, or other services. Members of this standing committee uh, are chosen by the staff at the National Academies. Um, we received nominations through a public nomination process that included input um, from public members, other members of the National Academies, um, partner organizations, and our sponsors. Bios for all of our committee members can be found on the project website, which I will show in a later slide, the link for the, pro the project website. And we also, and shortly will uh, let the committee introduce themselves. Uh, the committee members were chosen looking at their expertise um, for a broad range of topics around offshore wind energy, including commercial and recreational fishing, fisheries management, marine policy, offshore wind industry, uh, ocean and marine engineering, social sciences, um, state, local government, and tribal interests, um, as well as others around fisheries and offshore winds. In addition to these areas of expertise, we also looked for members that repre could represent knowledge from each of the large U.S. marine ecosystems. Standing committee membership is at 12 currently. Um, as this is a new standing committee, we will grow the committee up to 15 members. As members will rotate off, we are staggering the process of filling the full, full committee membership. Um, and additional areas of expertise will be added as uh, determined through meetings or public input of where um, we might be missing some for the committee. Um, and given such a small number of personnel to represent a large area looking at offshore wind energy and fisheries all around the United States, uh, members of the committee were chosen who have and broad, broad representations of their um, areas of expertise and um, background and experience. So we might not have every single individual fishery represented, um, but people that um, have good understanding of different regions and the fisheries within them. 
And now I will turn it back over to our chair and we'll allow the committee to give um, brief introductions. Great, thank you. And I'll remind committee members that if you can turn on your camera and the mic uh, when you do your introduction and also remind you that uh, they stay on time, please keep it short within a minute or so uh, would be wonderful. So my name is Jim Sankirico. I am a professor at the University of California, Davis in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy. I am trained as a natural resource economist and I do a lot of my research at the interface of economics, ecology, and policy. A fair amount of that research is evaluating fishery management policies around the world. I also was involved in a lot of early work on marine spatial planning. Dan. Hi, everyone. Daniel Doolittle. I'm Principal Environmental Scientist at FUGRO. I'm also responsible for managing FUGRO's environmental portfolio in the Americas region. I have a background in fisheries management, uh, both for salmon and ocean quahog and scallops prior to joining industry. Uh, and while in industry, we I've been focused primarily on geophysical mapping of the seafloor. Good afternoon, I'm Janet Duffy Anderson. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Gulf of Maine Research Institute. My background is in effects of anthropogenic uh, activities on ecosystem and fisheries outcomes. And I've worked in fisheries uh, in all of the large marine ecosystems in the United States. Oh, Trisha's not here. Steve. Hello, my name is Steve Joner. I'm with the Macaw Tribe in Washington State, and uh, my background is in fishery mm -hmm. conservation and management, and I'll leave it at that because I'll be talking to you for a half hour. Yeah, hi everyone, Eric Kingma. I am the uh, executive director of the Hawaii Longline Association. Um, have pretty long history in fisheries management in the U.S. Pacific Islands. Um, and been in the sort of commercial fishing industry now for the last five years. Uh, thanks. Hi, I'm Captain Dan Kipnis. Um, I was a commercial fisherman, recreational angler on party fishing boats. I've been involved in uh, marine fisheries regulations since I'm in my mid 30s. I'm 73 now, so it's been a long time. But uh, I'm a, an environmentalist and a climate change advocate, but I'm also very aware of the people, places, and things we will be affecting with our wind farms. So I look forward to this appointment and seeing how we can make everything work. Hello, I'm Sarah Maxwell. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, University of Washington on the Bothell campus. My research areas include fisheries and also uh, impacts from offshore wind, um, and I look forward to participating in the committee. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama. Uh, I'm appointed in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and also in the Department of Sociology. My background is, is working at the interface of fisheries ecology and environmental sociology, and I'm uh, involved in fisheries management primarily in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm on the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council's Standing Scientific and Statistical Committee, the SSC, and also the Ecosystem Technical Committee. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Ron Smallwitz. I'm a marine engineer, naval architect by training. I have 50 years of experience conducting surveys, uh, fishing gear design, exploratory fishing, working both for governments, uh, the environmental, non-government organizations, and the fishing industry. I have about uh, 40 peer-reviewed scientific publications on fisheries. Hi, my name is David Wallace. I represent the surf clam and ocean cog fishery, which is uh, being impacted by uh, wind turbines, which are being placed in our fishing grounds. 
I have served on numerous uh, habitat committees and fisheries management committees, as well as federal policy um, institutions. And um, I hope that I can be of some service. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dick Yu. I'm a professor of mechanical and ocean engineering at MIT. Uh, I've been uh, faculty there in the School of Engineering for way more than 40 years, coming on 50 years. Uh, I'm a member of the National Academy of Engineering. My uh, expertise and interests are in uh, civil environmental engineering, um, coastal and offshore engineering, pertaining to um, understanding the ocean environment, waves, uh, wave, wave interactions, wave current interactions, as well as um, uh, engineering in the ocean, uh, interaction of platforms, platform designs, uh, ocean platforms. Uh, I've also done research on uh, fish hydrodynamics, uh, fish schooling, uh, fish uh, sensing, uh, and I'm uh, also worked on uh, modeling and understanding, uh, for example, fish aquaculture and uh, fish farms. Uh, engineering and fish farm hydrodynamics. Thank you. All right, um, I briefly gave my introduction, but I'm Caroline Bell. I'm an associate program officer with the Ocean Studies Board here at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, my background is in physical oceanography and um, I was a Coast Guard officer for 15 years before coming to the National Academies. And next I'll turn it over to Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Roberts. I'm the director of the Ocean Studies Board, and uh, I've been doing that for uh, about 20 years now. My background's in marine biology. I have a PhD from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I oversee these activities of the Standing Committee and other Standing Committees and Consensus Studies of the National Academies Ocean Studies Board. Also, as part of our staff, we have um, Safa Wayne. She is our program assistant. Um, if she can wave her hand into the camera. <laughs> She's behind, behind the scenes helping keep everything running smoothly um, and doing a great job um, with all of the logistics for our, our mm -hmm. meetings. Uh, next, you'll see on the slide is the committee's statement of task. I'll leave this up for a minute. I'm not going to go through and read everything, but broadly, um, the committee uh, it was formed to uh, look at key uh, topics of interest to BOM um, around offshore wind and fisheries, uh, provide expert assessment um, of developments in fields of science and technology, um, look at and also looking at gaps and priorities in the research, and then provide stakeholder understanding around uh, offshore wind and fisheries. To so keep informed with this study, uh, we have a few links that you can see on the slide. The top one is to the directly to the committee's um, website where events will be added for future meetings and also for this meeting and past meetings, you can find recordings of the open sessions of the meetings, excuse me. For more um, information about the uh, Ocean Studies Board, the, the next link down is the Ocean Studies Board webpage. That is also where you can find um, a block at the bottom that says connect with us, where you can enter your email address to subscribe to updates, and that will give you automatic emails um, when we have new committee meetings for the standing committee and information about how to register. For the meeting today, you can see the agenda. Um, we will start with a presentation by our committee member, member Steve Joner, on the Treaty Tribes' relationship to fisheries management process. Then we'll shift to hear from um, BOM on their environmental programs. And then finally, for the four o'clock session, the committee will address a few um, future topics that we've been brainstorming um, 
for uh, later meetings of the standing committee, but we'll also open it up to hear um, either through Q&A or raised hand feature for the from the public um, about specific topic areas of interest that um, you as stakeholders in this offshore wind energy and fisheries would like uh, the committee to explore. We ask that during this time period that you address um, questions uh, and comments to the committee members, and these will be things that we'll take into consideration as we plan future meetings. Can't guarantee that we're going to cover every single topic that's addressed uh, as we have limited opportunities to meet as a committee, but we will um, work to incorporate the uh, input that we gather here today into future meeting plans. And then finally, uh, ask for those in the room and um, audience members, um, when you're not speaking, make sure you stay muted, um, use the raised hand feature or the question and answer, answer in Zoom for comments and questions. And then um, for our committee members in the room, and when uh, we call on the public to speak during the four o'clock session, uh, ask if you could turn your camera on to create a sense of community. And with that, we will turn it over. Uh, we'll pull up the slides for our first presentation. And are you going to advance? Okay. I'm going to turn the mic on. Okay. So I'm going to uh, not have my camera on so I can kind of follow along here. <clears throat> so, all right, well, I'm Steve Joner. I'm with the Macaw Indian Tribe in uh, Washington State. Um, like Captain Dan, I've been doing this a long time. I, I started with the tribe in uh, 1977. So uh, I'm going to talk today about the treaty tribes. And uh, this this presentation was prepared for the Marine Resource Education Program that's sponsored by the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And it was it's part of a, a management workshop given for fishermen to understand the management process. Um, so it is focused on that, um, and it's a little bit, as my friend Dan Waldack would say, uh, a little too much uh, inside baseball, but I'll do my best to keep you awake this afternoon. So starting out, uh, something you probably all know, but I'll remind you that the U.S. Constitution in Article 6, I have my pocket constitution <laughs> here, it says that this constitution and the laws uh, uh, developed thereof and treaties made by the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And so that's what we're talking about here with the treaties that these tribes in uh, the Northwest signed in the 1854 and 1855. There are uh, 20 tribes in Northwest Washington that have uh, treaties, five separate treaties, five different treaties with the United States. There are four tribes on the Columbia River that have treaties that were signed at the same time. And then there are, are two tribes in California that do not have treaties, but have reservation-based fish, fishing rights. So those uh, 26 tribes in total are active within the Fishery Management Council process and uh, harvest fish a variety of species that are managed by the Pacific Council. In addition, there are uh, tribes in uh, Southern Oregon that do not have treaties, but they are federally recognized tribes. And they are currently negotiating agreements with the state of Oregon uh, regarding management of fish and wildlife. And, and they do, uh, a couple of them do maintain their own hatcheries. So to put this in perspective for today, every one of these tribes, so that'd be about 30, uh, at least, are very concerned about uh, impacts from offshore wind development. So I'm going to give you an introduction to the to the treaty treaty tribes. The process, everything that the tribes went through uh, following the signing of their treaties up, up into today. So next slide. Um, there are uh, oh that went, went too far. There we go, Columbia River tribes. So as you can see, there are four tribes, Umatilla, Nez Perce, Warm Springs, and Yakima. Um, the Nez Perce are in Idaho, Warm Springs, and Umatilla in Oregon, and the Yakima's 
in Washington. They signed treaties in 1855 and they uh, fished for many thousands of years in the Columbia River. That picture you see there is of Salilo Falls, which was uh, about 80 miles upriver from Portland. And that was, uh, as what I know, is or was the oldest continuously inhabited settlement in North America. And that was a place where tribes would gather from all over the Northwest to harvest fish and trade. My dad would take us up there as a young boy, so I got to see that, and that really left an impression on me. Uh, unfortunately, that was covered when the Dallas Dam was built in 1957, so it's, uh, it's underwater now. Nevertheless, the tribes have continued to fish. Uh, they, like all the other tribes in the North, Northwest, ran into conflicts, uh, typically with, with the state or the non-Indian non settlers. And one of the first and earliest conflicts was with some uh, landowners who prohibited Yakima fishermen from accessing their fishing sites. That was in 1905. And the Supreme Court ruled that, that was in Winans, if you want to look that up. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, the treaty right allowed them access to their usual custom fishing grounds and that they could not be uh, denied access to those fishing grounds. Uh, they continued on. There were other conflicts. And then in, uh, I think it was 1968, a uh, number of the tribes uh, sued the state of Oregon in a federal court case known as uh, U.S. v. Oregon. And in 1969, Judge Belloni made his decision that the tribes were entitled to fish, that they were entitled to a fair and equitable share of salmon at their usual custom fishing stations and that they could not be denied access. The tribes had also ruled throughout this time period that any regulation of tribal fishing must be for conservation necessity only, meaning for perpetuation of the resource. And that was necessary for the courts to do because the states were constantly trying to enforce regulations on the tribe that were not necessary for conservation. Um, today, there are 14 dams on the main stem Columbia River, starting with the Bonneville Dam in 1938, and shortly after that, the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, in total, with all the dams on the Columbia River watershed, including the main stem and its tributaries, they produce 44% of the hydropower in the United States. So it, it's very important, but it has not been without a great cost. And this is this is something I want us to really be aware of, and for all of us to know that the, this was uh, you know it was a great economic development uh, for the United States. It came at a time when uh, the U.S. was going through a, a depression. It was a public works project, the first two dams. It aided the U.S. in the war effort later in the Cold War as the other dams were built, but it was not without great cost to the tribes. And even today. Uh, that is a problem. So the uh, United States, when it was constructing Grand Coulee Dam, and I was just made aware of this, sent a letter to Canada saying that they were building the two dams, Bonneville and Grand Coulee, and that Bonneville would have fish passage, but Grand Coulee wouldn't. And the U.S. wanted to know, were there any commercial fisheries in Canada? And Canada wrote back, we don't have any commercial fisheries, no problem here, go ahead and dam the river. And so this was done with total disregard of the tribes, which uh, today would, that could not happen, but that's the way things were back then. So, okay, next slide. So the next, uh, the next group up are the Klamath tribes. That's the Hoopa Valley and Yurok tribe. They have reservation-based fishing rights. And uh, that was a, the reservations were established, as you can see, in the 1800s. And in, in 1993, the United States determined that they were entitled to 50% of the harvestable fish in those rivers. So they too are part of the Pacific Council process. Next one. The uh, tribes listed here in Northwest Washington, the 20 tribes, which include the Macaw tribe that I'm with. 
uh, signed treaties in 1854 and 1855. And these, these tribes are collectively known as the Bolt Caseria tribes because it was a Judge George Bolt who in 1974 made his ruling that the tribes were entitled to 50% of the fish. Uh, of those tribes, there are four on the coast that fish in the ocean. All the tribes fish for salmon. Uh, there are 13 tribes, including the four on the coast and, and those of Puget Sound, who also fish for halibut. And of course, they all fish for shellfish and other species. Um, but as far as federal management goes, the, the four coastal tribes are the ones that are directly involved and regulated by the Pacific Council. Next one. So in 1854 and 55, these treaties were uh, negotiated between the United States and the, and the tribes. There were five treaty areas. The representative for the United States was Governor Isaac Stevens, uh, who is a territorial governor, ter the governor of uh, Washington Territory. And uh, there's inter interesting history about him. Um, he was from New England, as were many of the people uh, that the tribes dealt with. So uh, they called the white men Bostons because so many of them were from New England. <laughs> We always have a Boston in the room when I when I meet. But the the uh, the tribes uh, trees all they all have a common language that the right of taking fish at usual custom grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians in common with all citizens of the territory, or in the case uh, of the Macaws, all citizens of the United States. Next one. So I'm going to focus now in detail on the Macaw tribe because that's who I've been with and they have the most extensive marine fisheries of any of the tribes. So in theirs, they also have a, a clause in there that uh, they reserve the right to take whales and seals at their usual custom grounds and stations. At the time the treaty was signed, whaling was a very important part of the Macaw culture, subsistence and economy. And they harvested whales going out of uh, cedar canoes with an eight-man crew. They would go out as many as 100 miles out to sea to harvest whales and seals. And they, they sold their seal oil up and down the coast. They sold it to the, to the settlers to uh, uh, lamp oil and to lubricate their, their uh, steamships and so on. And so it was uh, very important to them. They were also very active in fishing halibut and they would trade halibut up and down the coast. And when the gold rush began, they would send halibut all the way down to San Francisco. Okay, next one. So when the Macaws negotiated this treaty uh, and to kind of put it in historical perspective, the Treaty of Oregon was signed in 1846 between the United States and Great Britain, which established the boundary between the two countries at 49 degrees, and then down through the strait that divides uh, the island, it's a Vancouver Island from the, uh, the San Juan Islands, and then out the Strait of Juan de Fuca and into the ocean. So if you look at that treaty, you'll see that the real focus was on the land. They wanted to establish ownership of the land and the water was not that important so that the Columbia River from where it entered across the 49 degree, 49th parallel down to the mouth and the, the straits going through the San Juan Islands and the Strait of Montefuca would be open and navigable to all the tribes so that nobody claimed the ocean. Of course, at that time, the, the claim to a territorial, territorial sea was three miles, which was a the length of a cannon shot. So you had two, two different parties negotiating this treaty with very different understandings of ownership. The Macaws were the owners of those fishing grounds and recognized as such by, by the other tribes. And the United States didn't have any concern about that. So the, those differences of understanding has, uh, that, that's still with us today. But you can see there that they wanted to be able to have the halibut, to take halibut where they wanted, or they'd become, he'd become a poor man. He wasn't worried about whether he'd have food to eat, but rather 
he could continue with his income. And uh, Sakawa wanted the sea. That was his country. And uh, I understand that he even took Isaac Stevens out in a canoe to show him his country. The land was, that was a necessity of life. You had to sleep on the land, a place to, to tie your canoe, but the, the sea was their country. And um, that, was, that was very clear from, from the history and from their, their, their culture even today. Um, Isaac Stevens assured them that uh, their fisheries could continue and, and he would even send them uh, kettles to try their oil, to render their oil and fishing apparatus. And the macaws were quick to uh, adapt uh, these new technologies because they wanted to catch fish. So new technology was great. Next one. So as in the Columbia River, there were conflicts between the, the state and the tribes. And um, this went on throughout Puget Sound and out on the coast. The uh, Puyallup tribe in South Puget Sound near the current city of Tacoma, they were having conflicts with the state over fish, over the steelhead fishery. The state tried to ban the use of gill nets. And so Puyallup one had to do with that. Uh, Puyallup two had to do with state power to enforce regulations. And those were kind of the, the predecessor to the Bolt ruling. Uh, in 1970, the United States and several of the tribes filed a complaint against the state of Washington because of the, the conflict and the state's uh, infringement and prohibiting the, the tribes from fishing in their uh, custom and usual manner. And this went before Judge Bolt, uh, and he was uh, a judge uh, out of the Tacoma office of the U.S. Uh, Western District of Washington. Next one. Judge Bolt made his landmark ruling. First thing he said was that the treaties were not a grant of rights to the Indians, but a grant of rights from them, and a reservation of those rights not granted. That was pretty radical. Uh, that was something very difficult for the state to understand. And to, to understand that they, they weren't granted, they weren't giving given these rights to the United States, but rather the tribes, uh, to the United States credit, recognize the tribes were the original uh, owners of, of these resources. And uh, the, the United States accepted that grant from the tribes while the tribes reserved the remainder for themselves. So Judge Bolt, uh, looking at the, the language used from New England uh, back in, in uh, 1855, he determined that in common meant equal sharing and ruled that the tribes were entitled to 50% of the harvestful fish passing through the respective UNAs. Uh, the, the state and uh, later federal regulations, uh, this uh, conservation necessity principle applied to both federal and state regulation. That was quite a battle getting that through. We, we still actually deal with that. And then another major decision was that uh, Judge Bolt made the tribes and the states co-managers co of the resource. That was very radical at the time. Uh, so that was in 1974. And then uh, 21 years later, 1995, the United States acknowledged the tribes as co-managers of fisheries uh, in the federal waters. Next one. Another one of Judge Bolt's key rulings that uh, the tribes in order to be self-regulating had to have competent leadership, uh, well-organized tribal government, uh, fisheries enforcement, well-qualified experts in fishery science and management. That brought me on the scene. There were a couple of us left in those early days. Um, they had to have a, a, a officially approved membership role. So you could determine who is eligible to fish and then photo identification. And this was something very important to Judge Bolt. 
because he did not want anybody involved with the tri in the tribal fisheries who weren't eligible to fish, weren't qualified. So Judge Bolt was very big on having an orderly fishery. Uh, he also established because the court or the, the state and the tribes were constantly running back to court with every little dispute, he established a fisheries advisory board that could hear these disputes and uh, make a recommendation. So if the state wanted to do something, the tribes disagreed or vice versa, you would ask the fisheries advisory board chairman to convene an FAB meeting. You'd present your side, state would present their side, and then the chairman would make a recommendation. It wasn't binding, but it was uh, clearly understood that you didn't want to have to go to Judge Bolt and say, I don't agree with what the chairman said. So uh, at one point, I believe it was in 1982 or 83, there were a hundred and almost 150 Fisher's Advisory Board meetings in one year. So every little <laughs> detail of every little fishery had to be ironed out. The other thing that the court had to do is determine the usual custom fishing areas for each tribe. Next one. He determined the inside waters in his original uh, the, the UNA for the inside waters in the northern southern, southern boundaries for the coastal tribes in 1974. Uh, but it wasn't until the Magnuson Act was established uh, that the uh, coastal tribes needed to establish a western boundary in order to fish in the USEEZ. So Macaw had its western boundary determined at uh, 12544, which is 40 miles offshore. And that was based on their uh, traditional fishing uh, up in the Canadian waters, which unfortunately are, are now in Canada. Macaws lost a big part of their uh, traditional fishing as a result. And that was done in 1976 when the EEZ was established. Next one. There's the current Macaw UNA, the blue shaded areas, the ocean that goes out 40 miles and it goes down roughly 20 miles from Cape Flattery, uh, which is in the kind of brown there. And then goes into the Strait of Juan de Fuca almost to Port Angeles. Mm -hmm. The other tribes uh, on the coast, they, they go down as far as Grace Harbor. Uh, the tribe just below goes to out to 40 miles, and the one the Quinal tribe below that goes out to 30 miles. Next one. Following uh, his ruling, there were um, uh, a lot of a lot of people who uh, could not accept it, and so there was a lot of violation of his orders. Uh, at times, he had to enforce his own rulings. Um, at one point, uh, it got so bad that a, a Coast Guardman was shot by somebody in one of these disputes. So uh, it was uh, kind of the Wild West. Um, the uh, Fisheries Advisory Board was active through the early 80s. We rarely use it anymore because pretty much everything's worked out. And then his ruling was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit and upheld by the United States in 1979 with only slight modifications. Next one. So Judge Bolt uh, established a process for doing sub proceedings, knowing that his initial ruling on salmon and steelhead would lead to uh, the need to, uh, to adjudicate other fisheries for other species. So the Macaws case, uh, one of the sub proceedings was the size limit for the macaw troll fishery. Macaws have an active salmon troll fishery, and the tribe had a different size limit than the state. And the state and the uh, Department of Commerce tried to enforce that size limit on the on the tribe. And so we went to the court, and the court determined it was not necessary for conservation. And uh, so there was another one. Uh, some of these uh, macaw bay net seizures. The states had a surf line agreement where there'd be no gill netting outside in the ocean, but the tribe had a traditional uh, set net fishery targeted on Chinook salmon that ran along the shoreline. And uh, the state decided they would seize those nets. So again, we went to court and the court determined it was not necessary for conservation and it was illegal. 
Uh, we had a subproceeding for halibut that went on for many, many years. That was followed by a subproceeding for shellfish, and then in Macaw's case, a subproceeding for whiting. Next one. The halibut ruling, uh, which uh, when I when I started with the tribe, the chairman told me my top priority is to get our halibut fishery back. So it meant many, many years going to the halibut commission until finally uh, the tribe filed uh, a request for determination. Uh, that was in 1985. Um, as with a lot of these, that set some uh, negotiations in place that went on until uh, the early 90s. And then we went back to the court and uh, Judge Rothstein ruled in the case of halibut that the tribes were entitled to 50% of the harvestable surplus. The way we determined how much that would be, we looked at the long-term catch in, in area 2A, which is Halibut Commission, <laughs> 2A, which is Washington, Oregon, and California. And during that period of time, 70% of the total catch in 2A was in the tribal area. So very simple, half of 70 is 35. People often have trouble. <laughs> if you get 50%, how come it was 35? Well, it is, it's, it's half of what's in the Macaw area. Um, she, and, and that was very difficult for the, the federal government and the Halibut Commission uh, to accept. But again, the conservation necessity principle uh, ruled the day. And, and so that's what we have to this day is that, that amount, that, that percentage. And there are 13 tribes that fish halibut in Washington. Next one. Shellfish. Uh, that one was fairly simple because the state said shellfish are not fish. And uh, the treaty talks about uh, the tribes can harvest fish and shellfish at their usual custom grounds and stations, provided, however, the tribes cannot harvest shellfish at places that are staked, meaning those are already cultivated by, by uh, non-tribal non members. And so obviously uh, they were fish. So Judge Rafiti, he said, well, shellfish are fish, so we'll move ahead with this. Uh, the state said that uh, deep water species did not count for the tribal share because the tribes either could not harvest them at treaty times because of lack of technology or there were no markets or no interest. And he said, look, because the treaties were a grant of right from the tribes, they reserve those rights. And so anything in their area is theirs. So it was very simple. And yet it was uh, one more thing that uh, uh, was, it was a simple decision, but it took a long time to achieve that. Um, and then because of his ruling, that uh, is not limited as to the species of fish that allowed us to move forward development of other fisheries. That is in the next slide. So um, the next one we uh, worked on was sable fish or black cod. We did the same exercise that we did with halibut and determined that about 20% of the coast wide sable fish on the west coast were caught in the tribal area. And so we negotiated this 10% share. Uh, that was not something the court ruled on, but we were able to negotiate, negotiate that with the state of Washington and the, and the federal agency. Then the next fishery for macaws was the whiting fishery. This is more of an industrial fishery because it takes larger boats. And because whiting must be processed shortly after they're harvested, um, we needed to develop a fishery with a mothership. And so um, we started that in 1996. And it was uh, not an easy thing, but it was much simpler to develop these uh, allocations and eventually settled on the current allocation, which is 17%, 17.5% of the coastwide share. Um, the, the United States and Canada negotiated an agreement on sharing whiting that was uh, concluded in, I think, 2003. And the parties decided uh, in that agreement, Come on. Uh, decided on sharing the fish. And 
the uh, the other thing was that they would establish a, a joint management committee or a commission for managing the trans transboundary stock. And so um, I've served on that commission since it started in in uh, 2011. I think it was our first year. Next one. That's uh, the, the current fleet. I asked one of my coworkers to take a picture on a sunny day. Uh, so you can see the macaws have about 70 vessels that fish long line, troll for salmon. And then the, the trawlers, whiting trawlers were all in Seattle having a shipyard work done. So they weren't there, but uh, there are uh, four vessels, three active that are 100, 120 foot vessels that fish. Uh, Pacific whiting and also are uh, qualified to fish pollock in Alaska. Next one. Um, I'll, I'll just rush through these since we're almost out of time. And, and this is just the, the process we go through, uh, through the Pacific, Pacific Fishery Management Council each year on setting the allocations and dealing with uh, rockfish conservation areas, eventual fish habitat, and the, the short story there is the, the tribes are, are not bound by the uh, other regulations, provided that we are able to achieve the same goal. And uh, we've been very successful in doing that. Next one. Um, you don't have to read the whole thing, but the the, the first one there, next to last line where it says 50%, the US in 95 determined that the tribes were entitled to 50% of the ground fish. And uh, the last one is that they were recognized as co-managers. And so that made uh, life a lot better, a lot simpler mm -hmm. for all of us. Next one. Um, The, I'm often asked, can the tribes do anything they want? And well, we could manage the fishery within the guidelines established. So in the case of halibut, the tribes are limited to hook and line only, can't catch them by trawl gear as is the case with others. And uh, we fall under the, uh, the authority of the federal regulation and the limits established by the International Pacific Halibut Commission. And as a result of that, we're very active in the IPHC process. Next one. Um, the Macaw tribe's been regulating its fisheries and its fishermen since 1937, the Fisheries Manager Program, again in 75. And uh, the tribe manages a total of uh, 30, 25 different fisheries. Um, I'll just skip through this one. Uh, oh, I, I, so I'll, I'll wrap up with this one, Colbert case. So I started talking about the Columbia River and the impact that that had on uh, blockage of fish migration and loss of habitat and uh, the billions of dollars that have been required to keep the fish runs alive in the Columbia River. Prior to contact by, by uh, non-Indians, there were 16 to 18 million fish returning to the Columbia River annually. Now that's averaging one to two million on a good year. And the, the tribes prior to that time were catching in the Columbia River 20 to 40 million pounds of salmon. So the dams have had just an unbelievable impact on, on the salmon runs and the habitat. Another problem that's occurring now is there are sturgeon below Bonneville Dam. The sturgeon can't get up the fish ladder. So there are small populations above the dam, but those in the main stem below are now being uh, eaten by the sea lions that come up to feed on the salmon. And so sea lions are actually killing and eating those large 10, 12 foot sturgeons. So that, that's a, a new problem. Um, so the Colbert case, uh, 
phase two of that says phase two, not phase one half. <laughs> I think it's just the lines up there. Um, the, Judge Bolt said oh, phase one will do the, the fishing outrights. Phase two will deal with the, the habitat and hatcheries. So the state said the tribes are not entitled to hatchery fish. Uh, and the court ruled that because hatcheries were for the most part to mitigate lost fishing habitat, that tribes are entitled to those fish. And they're entitled, uh, they have the right to have the fishery habitat protected from degradation. So uh, in 2001, there were, the tribes filed a request for determination uh, on culverts that block free passage of salmon. I don't understand how this was done, but there were hundreds and hundreds of culverts that were improperly placed so that it blocked migration of adult salmon going upstream, made it difficult for smolts going out and impossible for, for young salmon to move freely up and down the watershed. And there were uh, at least 1,200 miles of, of, uh, sh of stream that were, were blocked by these culverts were improperly placed. And so, again, it, it took a number of years to get to a trial. And in 2013, the court issued an injunction against the state and ordered the state to correct the 800 worst culverts and must be done by 2030. So that 2030 rings a bell, doesn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> so that was upheld by the Ninth Circuit and then by the Supreme Court in 2018. And the state is having trouble getting those done. It's current cost is three and a half to $4 billion. So the message here is that um, the treaty right is guaranteed by the Constitution. It's the supreme law of the land. And that we, we want BOEM, as we do with all the agencies that have a trust responsibility to the tribes, to work in good faith and um, to be very open to the tribes' recommendations and concerns here. If you look at the bookends uh, of my talk about the dams and then the culverts, that um, it's it's been a very lengthy battle. And I mentioned yesterday to the Bowen folks that, you know, I joke this, I'm from the tribe and I'm here to help, but, you know, the tribes uh, can be a very good partner because of the traditional ecological knowledge. And that's one thing I learned through my career is I had a head start on on my uh, my colleagues at the state and other places because uh, I had I had the uh, the folks within the tribe really tell me this this is the way things were so you knew better on how to get to where you were where you wanted to go because you knew where you were coming from so I, I want to offer that and. Um, Hopefully, this can be a better result than the dams or the culverts were. So, thanks. Thank you, Steve. There's a couple of minutes for questions. Sure, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much for that, Steve. I guess I would posit to you then what are the primary recommendations coming from the tribe? or tribes um, regarding offshore wind? So our primary concern is with uh, the impacts of the ecosystem. And when the dams were built, there were people sounding the alarm that you have to do this right or it's gonna be a problem. And unfortunately, those those calls weren't, weren't heeded. But um, the, the starting point for the tribes is that um, harvesting that wind is going to create uh, changes to the ecosystem, starting with upwelling and then everything that goes from there. So we're looking at the cumulative impact that this offshore wind would have on, on uh, primary productivity, the uh, production growth, movement of larval fish. Uh, for example, sable fish, black cod, 
uh, early in their life, they spend their first summer right on the surface of the water feeding, and they're very vulnerable to what's going on around them. There's one such nursery area right off the Strait of Juan de Fuca. I'm familiar with that, but you know, since there are uh, ten times more fish out, or uh, five times more fish outside the tribal area, there there have to be those nursery areas elsewhere. So. You know, we want to look at those. Um, and then when areas are closed to not, to fisheries, that's going to, to displace the current fisheries that will have an impact on other areas, including the tribes. So they're not exclusive. Other non-tribal fishermen could fish in the tribal areas. But right now we have kind of a happy equilibrium where people fish and if too many areas are closed, then we're going to be forced to have more, more company in our fishing areas. Um, we are concerned about uh, some species that come from California and migrate as they mature, if they're impacted by the, the wind areas in California. And um, uh, there was one other I just, uh, uh, but, the, but those are our primary concerns. And we think that uh, we really need to look into that and determine, you know, what will be the impacts, and then, uh, including marine, uh, marine mammals, and um, and then some species such as whiting. Uh, the U.S. has an obligation to Canada through the treaty, and since the whiting come from California, if the whiting production is impacted, then you know that that impacts our our agreement with Canada. And, and I'll add that every, every tribe I mentioned, every tribe is concerned about this because they all catch one species in common is salmon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so salmon would be very highly impacted by changes in starting with upwelling. Yeah. Steve, a similar question to Sarah's. Um, are you aware of models that you would say show showcase good co-management and good good cooperation with regulatory authorities. I, I'm, I'm thinking of some in Canada. I'm thinking of some in Alaska. But do, do you have any models that you would recommend that the committee think about studying? Well, I, I think the Pacific Fishery Management Council is probably the best model. And um, the tribes, uh, I'll tell you, when, when we started out, they, we weren't really welcome <laughs> at the table. And now there's a tribal representative sitting on the council. Uh, there, there are tribal representatives on just about every management team or advisory panel. I serve on a couple of them myself. And we're, you know, we're truly co-managers and partners. And, um, and then the Pacific Whiting uh, Agreement is another one where uh, it, it's successful because I believe the National Marine Fisheries Service you know, acknowledge the tribes as co-managers and they really understood what consultation was and that to me is probably the weak link in uh, federal uh, trust agencies dealing with the tribes and uh, not really understanding what true consultation is and we, we like to say you know don't come to us when you get to step two or three come to us at step zero Tell us you're thinking about doing something. And then that's that's the appropriate time to step in. Does, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I don't see anybody else raising their hands. So thank you very much, Steve. Sure. That was great. I really appreciate that. I know the committee does. So we are scheduled to go on a 15 minute break. And so we'll start up again at uh, 15 minutes after the hour. 315. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll come back from the break. Our, our next session is to hear from BOEM on their environmental um, programs. And it will be um, Jill Lewandowski and Ronnie Chuck will be sharing, will be presenting. Rodney Clark, I'm sorry. Rodney, 
there it is. Yep. And Jill, okay, Jill's going to share her screen. Perfect. So we'll let you two introduce um, yourselves and begin. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we have you loud and clear. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Rodney Clock, and uh, we'll be tag team a presentation here with uh, Jill Lewandowski. And we're going to talk a little bit about our environmental program, kind of focusing more on uh, science and assessment and how the science feeds into the assessment and informs decisions. Um, next. I am not sure if you can hear me, but I cannot hear um, the room remotely. Tricia, can you hear me now? Um, no. Um, Tricia, no. I, uh, I can hear uh, well. Um, okay. This is Dick. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. I'll touch base with Joan offline. Okay. Shall I continue? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, Bill Brown talked about this uh, at the last meeting a little bit, but I just wanted to remind folks about our mission here in Bohm as to manage development of uh, outer continental shelf energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. This includes oil and gas, um, marine minerals, renewable energy such as wind, uh, and also uh, carbon sequestration is also a, a new authority that we're, we're looking towards. Uh, as you can see here from the map, it's a pretty vast area uh, that we have to, to cover um, from the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, Pacific, all throughout Alaska, Hawaii, and then we recently have a, a, we received authority for uh, the uh, uh, several territories, which also are interested in, in renewable energy uh, and specifically wind. So, um, you know, big area and a lot of activities to cover. Next. But really the, the, the takeaway here, what we want to emphasize is uh, the application of the science for impact assessment. So, our environmental studies program, which I'm in charge of, um, you know, does the science to, to inform decisions. So that feeds in to our environmental assessment process, our environmental impact statements, our compliance documents. Uh, we really you know, are fortunate to have an environmental science program uh, that we can ask science questions and, and get the information we need to inform our environmental assessments. But you know, we don't do this in, in a vacuum. Uh, each year we go through a process where we seek public input. Uh, we, we work uh, closely with other, uh, other federal partners to determine our data needs, and we make everything available um, through our Environmental Studies Program Information System, our, our ESPIS. And we'll get, we're will get we going to talk about a little bit more about this, kind of this feedback loop uh, in, in a moment. And Jill's going to talk about it a bit more, but uh, so let me go ahead and move on to the next one. It's coming. Hang on. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So, uh, um, so our environmental program, just uh, in general, ensures that environmental protection formed by science and also law is the foremost concern and indispensable consideration in Bohm's decision making for energy and mineral development uh, on the outer continental shelf. Um, so it's a, you know it's really foundational and fundamental to everything that that we do as as an agency to consider uh, the, the environmental effects uh, uh, you know of, of the activities that I mentioned earlier that we oversee and how and how those can be formed by science to protect the environment. Next, so our environmental studies program, um, which turns fifty years old this year, so it's been around for uh, for quite a while. Uh, really produces a lot of the science that we use uh, to inform our decisions. Um, so it's a centralized program, um, but and, and it and we do the, and everything kind of runs through uh, our, our centralized program to inform decisions throughout all of the regions. Uh, you heard from a lot of the regional folks yesterday, and and the programs I mentioned of the various activities. We were authorized in Section 20 of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Um, We've 
in the last 50 years, um, as, as I estimate we've spent about 1.25 billion on, on research uh, since 73. We have around uh, 30 million a year uh, annually. So it's an ongoing program. A lot of the studies that we start, uh, you know, may take three to five years to complete. So at any given time, we'll have well over 100, 150 studies going on. So, so each year we, we go through this process. Um, so we go through a process of planning, review, and procurement. Um, so we don't do all the science ourselves internally. Uh, we have a couple hundred scientists in BOEM that come up with the study ideas. And we uh, work with other federal agencies through interagency agreements, uh, universities through cooperative agreements or competitive contracts uh, through the federal acquisition regulations. Um, I also wanted to mention with regard to cooperative agreements that we recently uh, um, discovered that we do have authority to do cooperative agreements with tribes. So we can use that mechanism to coordinate and, and um, um, co-produce knowledge with tribes. Next. So our science for informed decisions, um, it's always about the consideration of views. Uh, you know, how, what information do we need to use to inform decisions? Um, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't have a, a broader quest for fundamental understanding of the ecosystem and the environment, um, but we're not a basic research program like our friends at uh, National Science Foundation. We partner with them a lot, we work with them, um, but it really is about, you know, the application. So next, I think I have a quote here. Yes. So I love this quote by Louis Pasteur from 1863. Uh, there's not pure science and applied science, but only science and the application of science. So that's kind of what we, uh, you know, live by. Um, and, and the work that we've done over the years, uh, we've discovered hundreds of new, new species that are in the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. Um, so that is, you know, a, 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 that is discovery. That's a quest for a fundamental understanding. But again, all of our science is used to inform decisions in one way or the other. Next. So the pillars of the environmental studies program. Um, again, I like to call it use inspired um, because all of our, and I really kind of try to get that a message across to all of our science scientists that they're, uh, asking a science question, you know, again, how are we going to use it? That inspiration, of how that science can be applied is, is really quintessential here. But at the same time, we need to uphold the, the highest levels of credibility and integrity in, in that science. Um, we cannot do our job without partnering and, and leveraging. Uh, showing you, I showed you the map earlier over, you know, 3 billion acres and a $30 million annual budget. It's just simply not enough. Um, so we work really closely with other federal agencies, academics. Um, we can again work with tribes and communities to try to partner and, and leverage to the fullest extent possible. Um, if we're doing certain work um, that we need to partner with NASA because of using certain satellites, we do that often. That's an option. If we need aircraft, we may work with Fish and Wildlife or, or NOAA, uh, ships, NOAA, or Navy. So again, partnering and le leveraging is just really an important part of what we do. And we always make all of our information available through our websites. Uh, so we really are uh, really do ensure that, it, that the information gets out there and, and to promote outreach and education of the science that we do. Next. So our, our, our business model, um, I think there was some questions about this um, at the first meeting. Um, so again, we're not uh, we're not like uh, USGS, for example. You know, we don't have thousands of scientists. We do have a couple of hundred scientists. So we maintain this core expertise of scientific disciplines. Um, in many cases, we may only be one or two deep, um, but we do maintain this core expertise on biological. Um, oceanography, chemical oceanography, physical oceanography, anthropology, archaeology, sociology. Um, so the BOEM scientists develop and oversee and manage the research projects. We encourage them to, to engage and do uh, go out and do field work um, you know, with the researchers, but they really are, are the managers of the projects. 
and um, they engage, uh, we engage the scientific community, like I said, through academics, government, and private sector to conduct the research through those mechanisms I, I talked about earlier. So the model by design is, is small, nimble, um, and we go through this process to contract out the, the, the science each year. Next. So through our uh, 50 years of science and research partnering and leveraging, we've, um, we have a lot of partners. Uh, it's really important to, to reach out, uh, to go through um, you know, things like the National Oceanographic Partnership Program where we can leverage funds and work with others. Like I said earlier, if we need and feel that it's best to do um, you know, tagging of whales and animal telemetry with satellites, NASA has been a great partner on that. Uh, we work with NASA on, on air quality work. Um, NOAA, we work with them very often through the National Marine Fisheries Group and, and, and NCOS uh, and, and ocean exploration as well. So all these are, are partners that we work with often on, on, on an annual basis and, and we have continued these relationships over a really long period of time. Next. Now uh, our engagement strategies, um, um, we work with tribal partners through, uh, of course, the 106 consultations, but I also mentioned our co-production of knowledge earlier. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work in the past has been through just, um, you know, consultations with tribes. So I, I'm, I'm really pleased we can take that to a step, a step further and actually provide funding through cooperative agreements to work together. So we can work with tribes now, almost like we would with, uh, well, I guess almost exactly like we would with an academic institution where uh, funding is provided to co-produce knowledge. We're also uh, really interested and in support environmental justice communities uh, to work with low-income and minority areas to ensure there's not disproportionate impacts on those communities. And as we continue to move forward more and more, I think uh, public and private sector partnerships are going to be key. So working with um, offshore wind developers is going to be really important, uh, even more so as we move forward. Next. So what do we need to know? Um, several things. Um, one, we need to uh, have information on the environmental impacts from the activities authorized by Bon. Next. We need information, information on the status, trends, and resilience of potentially impacted natural and cultural resources and the socioeconomic qualities. So within the environmental studies program, <clears throat> it's clear we need to understand the human, marine, and coastal environments. So human is, is clearly in there. So uh, this is why we have a lot of sociologists, economists, anthropologists. So those cultural resources and socioeconomic qualities are really a cornerstone of what we do. And several of our studies uh, you know, fall into those disciplines. Next. Monitoring. Uh, this is also um, a, a real important point in the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act that defines the environmental studies program. Uh, we need information on monitoring environmental impacts uh, of the authors of the uh, things that we, uh, the activities we oversee uh, over the, the lifetime of these projects. Um, this can be very challenging. Um, again, with a limited research budget, um, I, I think uh, there was a discussion yesterday uh, and discussions at the first meeting about cumulative impacts. This is something that we're, uh, you know, is really important to us. And really the best way to be able to, to understand uh, changes in ecosystem, uh, changes in climate, uh, changes in, in uh, you know, from the activities we oversee and how that's affecting the environment is through long-term monitoring. Next. Uh, cumulative impacts, I, I got ahead of myself a bit, but uh, yeah, this information to address uh, requirements in NEPA and the OCS Lands Act, cumulative environmental impacts, again, are, are, are key to understanding this. <clears throat> but really, you know, without being able to monitor long-term, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to understand these changes in the, in the ecosystem or, or in the social fabric over time. Next. And we need information uh, required to demonstrate that bone decisions comply with uh, all of the environmental laws. So there's several environmental laws. I think Jill's gonna talk more about this. 
but everything from a Clean Air Act to Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, National Historic Preservation Act, all this, uh, these aspects of compliance, the Environmental Studies Program can help feed information in, in, into this compliance. Next, our strategic framework. In June 2020, we put out a strategic framework document. We need to, uh, uh, we plan on updating it um, this year. Um, yeah, go ahead and go to the next one, Joe. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, you know, the, this document really was the first time that the environmental studies program at least um, put forth something that really said we want to be first in class, so the best re research program in the context of our, our mission and constraints. Um, Again, we're not the National Science Foundation. We don't really do basic research. We don't have the funding that they do, but we want to be the best we can be for what we do. Um, so that focuses on what I just went through, what we need to know, you know, what are the strategic science questions we need to ask to inform decisions. But, you know, there has to be integrity and, and credibility in the science, as I mentioned earlier, but there has to be uh, credibility and integrity in the process. So the criteria for study development planning and approval is also really, really key. Uh, so there has to be a strong process for how we develop our study ideas, which we call profiles. We call them profiles, but essentially they're just the ideas and what we approve and how we do that. Next. So let me talk a little bit more about the criteria for study development and approval. Next. So, we have to focus on uh, uh, the need for the information for decision making, as uh, as I've said. So that's really kind of a key cornerstone. What do we need to know? What inf information do we need to inform decisions? But we also think about kind of this broader context of how the work we are, are doing or want to do contribute to the existing body of knowledge. So again, we're not working in a vacuum. Um, all of our scientists are not only using the studies produced through the environmental studies program, but anything and everything that's out there. Um, this is including academic work, other federal agencies, traditional ecological knowledge, all these fall into this category. Um, the research concept, design, and methodology has to be uh, have the utmost levels of uh, rigor and integrity. Um, with a small science program, as we have, uh, 30 million a year, we look towards, uh, is it cost effective and does it make sense? Um, and a lot of this centers around too, uh, our, uh, our scientists uh, incorporating innovative technologies and techniques to do the work. Things like in environmental DNA, um, are, are we using some of the, 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 the latest kind of technologies or robots to do, to do this work? This in the long term can save money. So we're always looking at cost, cost effectiveness and how we do this. Leveraging funds and partnering, uh, those two uh, things are always looked at when we're thinking about what science we need and uh, how our scientists are proposing their ideas. And will the, uh, the study idea and uh, ultimately the findings in that effort be able to be used for any kind of multiple regional um, or strategic utility? In other words, if we're doing certain type of work in the Atlantic, is it applicable to the Pacific? Um, or could a certain modeling effort be used across the, the outer continental shelf? So these things are, are what we look at, I mean, trying to get the most bang for our buck, really. Next. <clears throat> so um, each year uh, after we send out a note to all of our internal scientists, I do a request for stakeholder input. Usually around the November, December timeframe, it just kind of depends on uh, you know you, you know when we get there, but um, we send it out to several thousand stakeholders. Uh, we have a stakeholder list to get study ideas. In other words, you know um, what information does Bohm need to know to inform our decisions? After we get all that information in internally, this is disseminated across all of our offices uh, to all of our scientists to do this study profile development. Again, the study idea development. Um, Around now, uh, we are in the middle of doing uh, our study profile internal review. Actually, I think it just wrapped up um, a week or two ago. This is where all of our internal scientists um, review each other's work. Um, not so much to tell them if it's uh, 
Uh, it's not a dissertation defense, in other words, but to help them make it the best it possibly can be. So a collegial process to add value. Um, we then release a study development plan around the June timeframe. <clears throat> this, this is a plan with all of our study ideas in it. We put that up on our website. We then go through our National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine review, our Committee on Offshore Science and Assessment, where we have a meeting with, um, with that committee. This is a public meeting where they provide uh, comments and input on our study ideas, again, so we can work with them and improve them. Uh, I then go back to all of our offices and say, okay, you know, we usually get about 75, 70, 75 study ideas a year. We can fund maybe 20, 20 or 25 of those. So I ask uh, each office and region to rank them. Uh, you know, what are their priorities? What do you need to know now? Uh, what's the decision right in front of you? Um, so we can get those priority studies started first. <clears throat> Around October, I take uh, the, uh, this prioritized list uh, to our director who approves the national studies list. So she would approve what is going to be funded in, in, this, in the next fiscal year. Uh, we then uh, release that studies list and put it on our website for everybody to see. And then we begin our procurement process. And this again would be going through this process where we decide if we're gonna do a competitive contract, uh, a uh, cooperative agreement with, with the universities or multiple universities, uh, where we're gonna do a cooperative agreement with the tribe, um, or we'll work with other federal agencies to actually conduct the science. Next. Oh yeah, I just wanted to give you an idea on the uh, renewable energy spending that we've done. Um, so we've done about 280 studies. Um, remember the Energy Policy Act passed in 2005. So it's been um, nearly 20 years since we've had authority. Um, I, I wasn't in the program at that particular time, but after we kind of got kicked off after a couple of years, uh, you know, we've done a lot of studies over that time period. Uh, about 280 studies, over 162 million. You can see the different types of, of studies that we've done um, with fish and fisheries, for example, 56 studies at about $34 million. So there's quite a bit of information that has been collected over the years. And next. Great. And now it's Jill's turn. <laughs> now it's my turn. Um, I just want to check in. So I probably have about uh, 10 minutes worth of slides. Uh, do you need me to, is that okay? Or do you need me to go through them quick, more quickly? Uh, that's fine. We can um, go a little bit longer if committee members have questions um, since the next session after this is also kind of more uh, open dialogue. Okay, great, great. So yeah, so I'm Jill Lewandowski and I oversee our environmental assessment work at BOEM from a uh, national perspective. And I also direct our Center for Marine Acoustics. And I'll talk about both of these um, buckets as we go through my slides. Um, one thing I would say too, is just like the environmental studies program, uh, we have environmental assessment work that happens across the bureau. Uh, so we have what happens in the Office of Environmental Programs where Roddy and I sit, but we also within each of our regions um, and in our different program, office, uh, program offices, we also have uh, folks who are out there doing assessment work as well as uh, studies work as well. So I guess the, the, to set the stage, I kind of wanted to just point out that it, it's a complex environment that we work in, right? Not just from a, a pure environment perspective, but also from the legal um, aspects. And one important piece of how we do our assessment work is looking at the various laws and how, what do they say? What do they require us to look at? Um, many of the laws have like a certain standard that needs to be met. For example, in the Endangered Species Act, we need to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service. And there's, you know, a bar there of not, you know, jeopardizing the continued existence of a species or, you know, um, critically or adversely modifying critical habitat. Uh, but if you go to like the Marine Mammal Protection, um, act, the bar there is not to have more than a negligible impact, you know, on a particular population or stock of marine mammals. Um, and then you have like the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, where we have to provide consideration for 
um, impacts that may be happening um, that come into sanctuary waters, even if the activity is happening outside of that. Uh, Clean Air Act, migratory birds. Um, and I'd also point out that even the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act does have an element in there about not causing undue harm. You saw from our mission, our mission does have uh, a requirement in there that we not just safely, but we also um, you know, move forward with leasing and, and energy and minerals uh, production in an environmentally responsible way. And of course, related to this particular topic under the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, uh, you're all probably familiar with the essential fish habitat consultations. And those are also things that um, are in our sort of regulatory mix. So on the right here is, it's not surprising. This is basically the path that we go about if you could take environmental assessment and you could divide it up into steps. Um, this is what we would be looking at where you first have in the top red where you propose an activity. Uh, the next thing you do is, all right, in the environment where this activity is happening, what's going on there uh, from a human, a physical, um, and a, a biological standpoint. And if you look inside the circle there, you know, there's some examples of some of those resources, that description of the environment that we would look at. It could be fisheries, it could be environmental justice, it could be air quality, um, benthic, um, you know, there's, there's besides the ones icons were showing there, there's 13 other impact or, or, or resource areas that we would look for to describe in, in a particular area. As you move to the orange, then we're going to, after we were like, okay, we understand what's out here, we're now going to use the best available information from our environmental studies program, as well as other information out there. And we're going to assess impacts. We're going to, to then engage stakeholders, often it's stakeholders that yellow pieces throughout this, this um, circle here, but um, often there's a number of these acts like the National Environmental Policy Act that do have them maybe a public comment period. We will determine how can we mitigate. Um, our mitigation hierarchy is first to avoid. Where we can't avoid, we want to minimize. And so again, we're looking toward avoidance, but we recognize that's not going to be possible in all situations. And, and then we look towards how can we um, avoid is what I want to say, and then how can we minimize. And then we filter all that information up to uh, decision makers who are often our bureau director, could even be the secretary of interior. And then what we wanna do is after all that's done and things are happening in the water, we want to also do that piece that Rodney spoke about, which is the monitoring. So not just monitoring for impacts, but monitoring to get a sense of is our, the mitigations we're imposing, are they effective? And then that information feeds into future projects. So uh, if I speak a little bit towards what the uh, essentially office environmental programs, the headquarters aspects of uh, the environmental assessment program, um, the first one be transparent environmental risk. That, that is something that we do across the, the way. What we try to do here in my group is think about what are some better ways we can do that um, some of that actually links with the second uh, square there, which is about reimagining and streamlining environmental reviews. Uh, before there was in the last administration a uh, directive to reduce the size of NEEP documents, we had already started doing that because it was real clear no one wants to read a 700, 800, you know, thousand page NEPA document. No one's going to uh, be able to get the information that they want. So how can we use visuals? How can we condense our text? Um, how can we use other ways to convey risks so that it's real clear and easy for someone to, uh, to find the information that they're, they're looking for? Because usually as a stakeholder, you're gonna be interested in certain aspects and, and not necessarily in all of them. We look at if, um, innovative and effective best practices. Um, back in the day, it was usually a narrative um, now you'll see a lot of modeling. You'll see, um, you know, relativistic risk assessment frameworks. Um, you were looking at ecosystem-based um, types of um, assessments. So we're we're trying to to build in that rigor and build in um, ways to not just narratively talk about impacts and what that might be, but also be able to quantify them. And of course, compliance with laws. 
um, advancing proactive solutions and programmatic approaches. So uh, we do have some things where we are trying to look for solutions that would apply across all of our programs and how we can uh, assess and convey risk. We may, like we are doing for offshore wind in the Atlantic, we are working on a programmatic NEPA document for the New York bite leases so that we can take an earlier look at collectively those leases together. And then, of course, we do a lot of uh, collaboration um, work in, in trying to build partners so that we can achieve protections that we perhaps can't quite get to or see or figure out on our own. So BOEM created its Center for Marine Acoustics back in 2020, but I, I'd say it's really over a decade in the making. Um, acoustics is one issue that is relevant in every one of our uh, program areas, so oil and gas, renewables, um, marine minerals, and of course it will be in carbon sequestration as well. It's involved it's in every aspect of development, so whether it's in site assessment to construction, um, through operation and decommissioning. So we realized, you know, we've been spending a couple decades on this issue and we're not quite getting the traction that we need to be. Um, we're not able to sort of evaluate and be transparent on the risk and understand it in a way that we need to. So we created a center of expertise to do that. And what we are, are, we came up with a vision that's not necessarily very technically oriented, but we we basically felt like we want to be a trusted voice. So whether it's modeling we put out or we put out technical papers, we have policy improvements, uh, education and outreach through messaging or how we work with our partners. Uh, if we're trusted, that means that we are doing an effective job. We're being transparent. Our, our products and our services are dependable. So um, we have been making a lot of progress just in a few short years and have been able to build up a, a staff of about seven full-time people now to help us um, in this area. And we also have developed an acoustic science strategy, trying to look not just uh, from year to year what we need, but try to project a little bit into the future on from an acoustic perspective on what would across the Bureau, what would our needs be, where are there common needs with different programs, and how might we be able to stage some of this um, information. So as we submit profiles into the environmental studies process, like everyone else does, uh, we know that we are doing things that, that are timely and we're prioritizing as we go along. And then another uh, center that we're working on developing right now, so it's in a proposal uh, stage, but it's around innovation ocean monitoring. And basically, uh, Rodney sort of described, we have uh, probably what's considered to be a small program, a research program in the context of larger programs like NOAA or the National Science Foundation. Um, but we do a lot of really great work. But what we need to be doing is finding innovative ways to answer questions, like particularly how do we better predict impacts? Um, but we need to do that by finding uh, effective ways to actually monitor through technology, as well as cost effective, because we do have a limited budget. And if we can find ways to be more cost effective and, you know, also have uh, technology that improves the information that we're gathering, that's going to go a long way in helping us um, better assess risk. So this is uh, a center that is currently um, in its proposal stage. And then we do have a relationship with the National Academies, and that goes not just from an assessment perspective, but also from a science perspective. Uh, we do have in the middle there, the Standing Advisory Committee, we do have one an, um, offshore science and assessment, which we call COSA. And that was established in 2015. And we will often go there and they will ask us on certain topics we're working on, or we will ask them to give us feedback on a topic that we've been working on. Are we doing it right? Are we pursuing the right things? Do we have the right science questions? Are we transmitting that, um, or translating that risk into things that are meaningful and um, understandable? So that is one that's very active. And of course, there's the, the committee that we're speaking to today, Officer Wind and Fisheries, that is newer. But we do work with the National Academy of Science on um, general peer review work, consensus studies, workshops. Um, for example, we have one uh, that we have uh, just funded that is going to look at the hydrodynamic impacts of the presence of turbines. 
and structures and um, you know, trying to, to get a little bit more information because there are models out there and the models show different things. And the models show that, you know, likely there is some localized, um, very, you know, very uh, impacts, but what does that mean to the ecosystem? What does that mean to the prey fields? Those are the sorts of questions that we wanna get academy level input into helping us, how do we move forward into really understanding that issue? And also with the academies, we did um, have them do what we call first in class. So when you hear us say first in class, uh, we're not just throwing that phrase around. Uh, we actually had the committee do an evaluation, um, not of our programs per se, but of a program like ours, what are attributes of a first in class program? And, and they came back to us with a, a list of about 18. And basically those are attributes, things we can measure against. Um, that would indicate that we are working at a first in class level. Uh, so, for example, one of them was about implementing, uh, you know, innovation strategies. So this Center for uh, Innovative Ocean Monitoring is one example of how we're kind of leaning into that innovation. Not the only example, but one of them. And then we currently have an internal process going on to look at all those attributes. Uh, we do have to apply some kind of ranking to them as to which ones we want to lean into first and then measuring against what we're doing and identifying improvements to our program from there. And then separately from the committee, we do also have um, an evaluating connection study that we have been working on for several years now. And that goes back to that green feedback loop we started with. So it's great if we say we have this feedback loop and basically questions that come out of our assessment documents that haven't been answered, we feedback into our environmental studies program. They let the you know contract out the research to help get us some answers. And then we feed that back into future assessments, but we need to know, is that system working? And so we did have a third party come in and evaluate that system and come up with some recommendations. And we are also looking at those recommendations now and how we can incorporate them as improvements into our programs. And that is it, um, all that we have to present, but we're, we're happy to obviously answer questions. And so I'll turn it back to you. Sure, I'll open it up. Thank you very much for the presentations. I knew this group is slow on the first question, so I'll ask the first <laughs> question to get us all warmed up. Uh, this is really sort of for Rodney. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, how you guys define use inspired? Because I could imagine use inspired is conditional on the mission of BOEM and the interior um or on your authority versus use inspired is much broader definition of knowledge we need that goes beyond just Bohm's interests and authority uh in the environment so could you talk a little bit about how you guys define that uh, operationally um in your context when you're thinking about the science yeah uh, sure yeah uh, and what well, kind of goes back to what i was you know my talking about earlier trying to you know, really make the point of uh, um, you know, trying to hit the target with regard to the information that we need to to inform any kind of decisions that that are out there. Uh, it goes back to the compliance aspects, um, the various laws that we need to follow. Um, so when we're talking about you know and, and inspired by by use, um, you know when I, when I you know we all. I guess uh, when, we, when we get all of our study ideas, as you might imagine, um, uh, there's all kinds of things that we have to consider, and uh, and we it really I was trying to get uh, inspire people to uh, to hone in. Uh, one of the first questions I always ask is, you know, you know, what's this information applicable to? Uh, so that consideration of use needs to be built in to any type of scientist design. And their their imagination of, of what kind of, uh, of of information if it's an archaeology study if it's a marine mammal study uh, you know how that information will be applied you know to a decision um, whether that's a proposed wind farm that may come up uh, you know in a particular area 
or for broader mitigation purposes. Um, so uh, again, it's it's relatively straightforward in the sense, uh, I think it sounds more elegant than, than applied research, but uh, uh, it, it is again, just the, just the context of how are we gonna use this idea you come up with? You know, and uh, and and we try to make them focus focus in on that application. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, you said that it takes uh, three to five years to ramp up and get your study going, and then maybe you mean to ramp up, get it going, and finish it. Finish it. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say most studies take you know, three to five years to, to complete because okay. you may need field seasons and collect data over several years. Yeah. My question, all right. Uh, we're about to start. We're laying cable in some places. It'll be done in three to five years. So we really won't know on these first ones. Um, many of the questions that we will have will arise after the project is done. And the I, I don't understand. You could guess at what you want to study or what you want to see, but you really won't know till you get it done. And we'll have some of them finished before you even finish your studies. So how would you address this in a more efficient manner if you had the opportunity to do it? Well, um, let me first say that, you know, um, you know, we have an annual process that we start, you know, new efforts each year. So we've been doing this for 50 years. So there's a lot of information out there. The, again, the Energy Policy Act passed uh, about 20 years ago. So a lot of baseline information on, on birds and fish. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of studies have already been conducted. And we've already, you know, we've identified gaps and we're, uh, we're building on, on those information needs. You know, what else do we need to know just to, to inform these decisions as, as time goes? Again, we are fortunate to have an annual budget where we can start studies every year and just keep going. Uh, so um, it's not something that's a that's a one off. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of work, for example, with cabling and other other work on benthic, benthic habitats, uh, fisheries, just, just ecosystem studies. So yeah. uh, the, the, these these things have you know are are continuing and ongoing. I would say. And I would just add to that um, I, the, what comes out of our studies is really integral to our assessment work, but we're also looking at what exists out there in the oh, sure. world. So, you know, we take a lot from uh, some of the, you know, experiences in Europe and other places as far as who have projects in the water. It's not always directly translatable, but where it seems like it can or serve as a proxy, we do pull that information in as well. And of course, there's universities, there's other federal agencies, there's states, there's a lot of other folks yeah. out there. We're not the only game in town. Yep. Well, true, if I may follow up on that, and I agree with you, you talked about long-term monitoring as well. And $30 million a year sounds like a lot of science money, but you know, you guys are looking at ocean mining, you're looking at uh, leases for drilling, uh, for hydrocarbon production, for all kinds of stuff. So it's not just this this wind. So if you take that $30 million and you talk about long-term monitoring, but you split it up amongst all the other things that you're tasked to do, it really doesn't leave a lot of money. <laughs> we better hope that we come up with another way of, of looking at that long-term monitoring, or we're going to have 14 or 15 of these things built without knowing what the long-term effect is going to be. So I think this, yeah, I think oh, sorry. Uh, I mentioned, you know, the importance of partnership, uh, of partnerships, and I think uh, one way to really kind of, I mean, that's a big challenge, and you're absolutely right, but we need to work with uh, wind developers out there. We need to, uh, get, you know, to, to work with others um, to uh, leverage and partner and, and work together to do that, that monitoring, and I think it can really only be done you know, with these public and private sector partnerships. I mean, we just simply don't have enough to monitor every species in every area in the ocean, you know, uh, across the US. So it's really gonna take uh, a uh, um, kind of all hands on deck approach, I think. I appreciate the honesty of your answer, okay? And you got right after what I was, what I was <laughs> shooting for. I appreciate that. So um, 
Rodney and Jill, are you okay to stay around for a little bit longer uh, sure. in the question and answer yeah. session? We go through the four o'clock. I just want to make sure because we've got a couple of hands up and, and I like the conversation. So if you're okay to stay around, I'd appreciate it. But I also know you might have schedules. So sure, I can stay around. Sorry, I talked so long. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's my fault again, Jill. I talked too long again. So. <laughs> I warned him. I did warn him. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. So in terms of questions, I've got Ron, and then we'll go online with Erica and Tricia, and then we'll come back to Steve. Okay, and then two Steves. I uh, thank you for the presentations. I get my question is a marine acoustics question. Uh, from our first meeting and from the press, stakeholders are very concerned about the potential impact of seismic profiling on marine mammals, and uh, the fishing industry is also concerned about the various species. So I went looking for when and where seismic profiling has been taken place. In other words, I would expect uh, such an important issue, we'd see some charts indicating the time and place of uh, sub-bottom profiling and some information about the acoustic levels. Uh, does that exist? Is that available? Is somebody looking at this? How, how are you addressing this important issue to the stakeholders? Great. Yes. And I agree. It is an important issue for the stakeholders. So, um, yeah, we are looking at all of that. Um, we had coincidentally been really leaning into um, these high resolution sources. So I do want to make sure folks understand that none of this is air guns. Um, I know there's been some confusion out there about the use of air guns uh, related to offshore wind surveys, and that is not being used for offshore wind surveys. What the sound sources are, high-res sources that are uh, less power and, and less uh, intensity. Now, that doesn't mean could there be impacts. So we had uh, several years ago started looking into it because our feeling from an acoustics perspective and knowing what we know about animal hearing and, and pro propagation of sound in the water is we were not concerned about these sources, but we said we need to check that assumption. So we led a few studies that did actual first lab, then field um, verification and then modeling. And uh, we actually had just put out a paper back in 2022 that found most of these sources to be de minimis. Uh, some uh, perhaps maybe not, uh, maybe a little bit, you know, where it could have some impact. And we were mainly looking at marine mammals in, in the context of this. And so we had been working with NOAA to sort of identify, okay, for the ones that do you agree with our assessment? Because our assessment wasn't just us, it was other, other scientists um, independent and within the government. And uh, if so, let's just, uh, you know, focus our goal with that was to be like, let's let's see if we can close the book a little bit on whether these uh, sources are impactful. And if there are areas where we need to apply, continue to apply mitigation, because they've been applied all along, then that's great. But if there are some things that we can sort of move out the table so we can devote our time and resource to things that we felt might have more potential, let's take care of that now. So we had done all of this work, and then this started coming out. And I would point out that you know, the unusual mortality events that are happening, um, they've been happening since about 2015, 16, depending on which of the two you're talking about, as well as strandings that have that have gone on. We, NOAA, Marine Mammal Commission, and many, many um, independent um, academic experts, no one is finding causation between these surveys and uh, what is happening. Um, I think what we're seeing happening with whales through these unusual mortality events is likely to some degree human cause, but not caused by these surveys. I think what we're seeing in about 40% of the animals that they have necropsied is evidence of ship strike. And you know when these surveys are happening, because uh, you don't want to just look at it from an acoustics perspective. You also want to think about vessel strike potential. But they they are traveling, except when they're traveling on site, they do have protective species observers that are looking actively for uh, marine mammals and turtles as they're transiting. But then when they're operating, they're going at very slow paces below 10 knots. So these animals are getting struck by ships. And there is some level of entanglement that's happening. And there's climate change. And there's uh, shifting prey. 
Um, we are trying to take a look at the Menhaden and what that we think that's coming closer to shore, probably bringing more humpbacks closer to shore. And they're probably coming into areas where there's human activity as well. So yes, we are looking at all of that. We know what activities have been happening with um, you know, offshore wind through the permits that have been issued by BOEM um, in some cases. And of course, the authorizations under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and Endangered Species Act by, by NOAA. But again, all after looking at all of that and re-looking at everything we've done, we still feel there is no cause it is not these surveys that are causing these strandings. Uh, but I, I guess my question was, again, cannot we get the data where the transects occurring and what are the acoustic levels? Because I've read all the reports and documents. Right. The sound levels are higher if they're being used that are in the, the BOEM documents that went to the fishery service levels in 180 to 240 decibel range have been shown to cause behavioral changes in marine mammals. A marine mammal that's stressed might be more likely to be hit by a ship. So the public has a lot of questions about this. Sure. We also have some issues with scallops dying and in areas that have been surveyed. So we need to know where the surveys are taking place and what the sound levels are. And I'm just asking if that information um, is available. The information on where the surveys are taking place, that's still being, I think, compiled and determining how that's going to be sort of put out there. I, I would caution you to be careful not just to look at a, at a DB level, because what we do know from decades of research across from various uh, parties uh, globally it's not just a decibel level, right? It, there's a lot of aspects that go in its frequency content. You can have a high decibel level, but if the frequency isn't within the hearing range, then you know it's it doesn't necessarily matter. And some of these high res sources are not in the frequency range of of marine mammals. So there's also you know how the the sound is being directed. Though they're often very narrow beam widths of sound. Now, of course, it propagates out a little bit because because uh, water is a good a good um, uh, source for transmission. But they're really focused downward, and so it the effect of having that high of a decibel level isn't going to be expanding out to uh, hundreds of meters or kilometers. Um, so yeah, we can provide because within each of the surveys, they uh, where we where we approve it, they talk about the the um, the sound levels and they cannot exceed those. Uh, we also have a sound source list coming out that talks about every single type of sound source that could be used um, and what the what the decibel levels are at, at the at the source, right? And those are at the source, not what they might be at ten meters, twenty meters, or hundred meters from the source. So we can follow up and get you more information, I guess is the bottom line. Thank you. Okay. That's Thanks, Jill. Um, I do want to be cognizant that part of this next session was bringing in the opportunity for the public to ask questions. So um, I just say that before we, we have four at least questions that I know of the committee. And so uh, Eric, why don't you, uh, you go next? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Eric Kingler from Hawaii Lone Line Association. Um, thanks for the presentation. A lot of interesting process and, and research going on. My kind of specific question is, what is the state of understanding with um, impacts to offshore wind impacts to larval drift or dispersion and the potential impact on, uh, I heard today, upwelling, which is really alarming. So I just want to get a sense, uh, what's the state of the science there and understanding of those impacts? Um, I'm really interested in understanding how BOEM has or plans to interact with the regional councils and the science and statistical committees. And then lastly, I don't think you guys have to answer it, but at some point, um, would like to find some information on uh, what steps along the process is NEPA, NEPA applied um, and who conducts those analyses? Is it BOEM in the very early stages and then it's the actual developers um, later? So sorry for kind of three parts there, but mostly interested in your guys' perspective on the state of the science on impacts to, to larval as well as um, kind of currents and upwelling. Thanks. 
Jill, you want to take it or you want me to? Do you want to start and then I'll, I'll follow up with a probably the uh, a good start and I'll follow up. Yeah, we are looking at, uh, st uh, we are starting a new study uh, on, on the upwelling uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So that will be something that we're uh, focused focused on. There have been some academic papers um, put, put out, but uh, we want to try to get a better handle on uh, exactly that, what you mentioned. Um, and we're also seeking advice from the National Academy uh, on this issue as as well to uh, to, to work towards this. Um, we do have a, a somebody uh, that's one of our scientists that is, is really taking a really hard hard look at this. And um, I wish that individual was on; he can answer this the question mm -hmm. regarding upwelling much better than I. Um, but I, I, I agree; it's a it's it's an important issue. Um, and uh, we are taking a hard look at it. I guess that's what I can say at this point. Um, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, the, what I would also add is, um, besides the upwelling study, I, I mentioned early on that we have uh, the National Academies reviewing hydrodynamics issue, which is related, right? So it might not be per right. se an upwelling. Um, but, you know, um, how is that sort of going to affect the community, the prey field and the, and the, the more local slash regional ecosystem, it will it, and, and then how could we understand that better? I think we could probably in the larval issue, um, get somebody else who's gonna be able to tell you better than Rodin or I can to, to provide a response to that question. And we could provide that, um, you know, in writing to the committee. And then on the NEPA stuff, um, yes. Yeah, so the way it goes is um, there, so the 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 companies hire a third party contractor to develop the NEPA documents, but they but that contractor is under BOEM's direction. So they're essentially funding us. <laughs> they're funding someone else to do the work for us. And so uh, we will work with them. We have, for example, done a lot of things like we do prepared content where this is what we believe are the effects of something, therefore you must use it. But all of those documents come to us for review. We review them. They go out to our cooperating agencies for review. Uh, then they go out to the public for review. And that happens again as we go from a draft NEPA document to a final NEPA document. Um, so I think that answers your NEPA question. Um, so although, yes, it is funded by the operators, uh, the control of the document, of the content, um, is uh, at the discretion of BOEM. Thanks. Did we get all your questions? Uh, maybe later at some point we could have a discussion about how um, you guys interact, interface with the regional councils. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, we can also provide that, that that information later. Okay. Yeah, it, this is Brian Hooker. I'm I'm in the room. Uh, and, yes. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Rodney out a little bit on this. Um, so, so yes, on the on the hydrodynamic modeling larval transport, uh, the two studies that we have funded and completed on the Atlantic. Again, these are fixed bottom uh, foundations. We've done uh, scallop uh, transport modeling, scallop larval transport modeling. Um, we used uh, um, Whiting Silver Hake. Um, to uh, for a ground fish species and um, have done summer flounder as well. Um, we have two more uh, that have just kicked off that are going to be uh, modeling some of the same species again, but more of a focus on the mid-Atlantic rather than southern New England where the first ones occurred. Um, I think on the West Coast, we have started some, um, you know, when there's been some modeling of wind wake loss fields, and I don't know if Tom Kirkpatrick is on, but we can definitely supply you with uh, that study. Uh, but it's a much, it's a different environment there, right? Because you don't have as much, you don't have the, um, the, the, the foundation extending all the way through the water column. So it's a more of a wind driven um, rather than the, the hydrodynamics of water uh, moving around a pile that is uh, on the seafloor. So again, um, you know, the West Coast is a little bit further behind where, you know, you may not know yet, um, you know, what size turbines you're talking about, the, the, the spacing of the turbines, all of which are important to having a, a good model. 
one where we have a lot more of that information on the East Coast where we have construction operation plans before us. We have a, an agreed upon layout in Southern New England that allows us to uh, model that fairly accurately. So I just wanted to add that on and, and we can certainly supply the uh, committee with, uh, with those studies. And then I think Brian could help us as well to get the larval impacts and the engagement with the Fishery Management Council's information to you as well. Thanks, Brian. Tricia? Hi, thanks. Um, so I guess my question is really one around um, funding and capacity and also coordination um, with other ongoing regional efforts. So on the on the first part of the question related to kind of funding and capacity, it sounds like there's some really interesting opportunities and um, proposals, you know, especially around this innovative ocean monitoring center um, and some of the um, identified attributes that COSA is coming up with. Um, we know that the most recent, I think, lease sale in the New York bite um, generated about $4.4 billion um, compared to oil and most recent Gulf of Mexico oil and gas lease sale, which was like 200 million. So I guess my question is, um, how can we deploy the lease sale revenues in the absence of a law change to support some of the longer term monitoring and um, research and science efforts that we need um, to support a sustainable growth of the offshore wind industry um, in this space and or um, you know looking at the non-cash aspects of the lease sales um, in terms of generating um, or incentivizing innovation mm -hmm. to support or funding to support these research efforts um, or research toward the attributes that are, that were identified and then um, on the coordination piece you know we have the regional wildlife science collaborative that is working to develop an integrated science plan and there's some other efforts that are that are looking to do that so how i guess i'm i'm wanting to understand a little bit more about how the work that you're doing there aligns with or feeds into these other regional efforts and vice versa um, so that we are being a, as effective and cost effective um, as possible in that approach um, I, I would just, maybe I can start and then Rodney, you can fill in, but I, I would just say, you know, our funding comes from appropriations. Uh, so it does not come directly from um, lease revenues. So it's, yeah, it's in our appropriations is is how we, we get that. And I think we've become very good, but we can always get really, 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 really good at um, doing a lot of cross sharing and partnerships. That's generally how we try to take the piece that we do get and and really maximize its value. We have, uh, you know, staff and all that are sitting on a lot of these regional um, collaborative, the, the RWSC and other sorts of things that so we're engaged in what's happening there. We're contributing it, contributing to the content. And then we're also, you know, pulling the products that come out of that and looking at our programs and where we can find a uh, value. I know from an environmental perspective, when it comes to like mitigation, for example, uh, looking at, you know, the potential for leasing or bidding credits and operating credits um, to fund some things like some quieting technology related to uh, pile driving. So uh, we are trying to do our best to sort of try to be efficient and, and expand our dollars. But Rodney, would you like to uh, add to that? Yeah, it was a great question about the, you know, a percentage of kind of the lease revenues coming coming in. But like Jill said, we get our money through appropriations. Uh, but but still, that doesn't stop me from thinking about that because I have thought about that a lot of times. But uh, it's kind of not on the on on the table. Uh, but um, so it really is it is what it is with regard to the money we get, you know, from our from, you know, from, from Congress really. So, um, but as far as the uh, yeah, the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, I met with them a few weeks ago and had some ongoing conversations. Um, yeah, we do have folks that are on their uh, science committee to kind of drive their the science that's needed in, in, in those particular areas and regions, which is um, you know, really, 
really, I think, uh, you know, an important uh, aspect of it. They, they said they actually, you know, had used our study development planning process with our study profiles to help them, you know, you know look towards what information may be needed. So I think uh, groups like that are really important to help inform uh, you know, gaps and information needs as, as we move forward. Um, there's also, I'm sure you're familiar with NROC, Northeast Regional Ocean Council, and these various councils that, that are out there, which also have connections, um, you know, and, and we have connections. I said on that committee years ago, but uh, we have other folks that are involved in, in that as well. So these kind of uh, uh, touch points, I think, are very, um, are very important. Um, I mean, interestingly, you know, when you went, mentioned a regional wildlife science collaborative, they are kind of special in the sense that they can, you know, uh, take in funds, you know, from uh, from entities and then push them back out to, you know, to do scientific research. So there's very few entities that exist like that, you know, uh, around our country. Um, so they, uh, it, this is why, you know, we have been having some conversations with them and, and are looking towards uh, potentially future work, but. Uh, Again, it needs to focus on our yeast inspired model, which I think, uh, I think we're aligning that fairly well right now. Great, thank you. Steve? So, um, uh, Eric asked my questions, but you, you, were, you didn't get the last one, which is collaborating with the SSC. So, these these questions of uh, hydrodynamics, uh, upwelling, larval transport, you know, they're they're constantly on our mind out on the west coast. So my question, yes or no? <laughs> Will one of you come to Vancouver, Washington, June twenty first through twenty seventh to meet with those of us who will be at the Pacific Council meeting, and uh, that those will include our our Marine Planning Committee, uh, SSC, ground fish team, tribes, you know, everybody who's got very deep interest in this. I think that would be very, very helpful for all of us. Okay, we can, we, we can yeah, look into our scheduling and, and see, uh, yeah, and check that out. All right, Sarah, did you wanna have a question? I, I yeah, I was curious, uh, Brian, if you could tell us what some of the results are of the studies. You said they're completed. You kind of talked about them, but I was just curious if you could summarize them, if you know them well enough to do so. Um, I think, generally speaking, you know, you can detect, um, you know, differences in the transport before and after, but the, the significance, and I think we've gotten to some of the this this question of, you know, well, is it what's the significance level of that? And they did not appear to be, you know, significant level changes like the not totally changing the direct directory of where um, larval settlement is. It's um, within, you know, what we do is you compare the model before and after, right? And so you get, um, you know, a, a, it, it varies with species, but, um, you know, the difference between the base and the model runs are, you know, within the range of natural variability. So not dramatic, but you can through the model see a see a difference. Um, and that's what we've seen on the Atlantic so far. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, we are then going to officially transition to our next session. Um, but we have actually been already doing the next sessions. But <laughs> By officially doing this will also open up the possibility of uh, some of the non-committee members to be able to raise their hand uh, and uh, contribute. The goal of this next session was really to sort of, you know, start this brainstorming process with BOEM about future topics for the committee to uh, work on or address, in, in, whether it be in our sessions or designs of future workshops or something. That was the goal of what this part of this uh, session is. And so I'll start it off trying to summarize some of the earlier conversations at risk that committee members could jump in uh, to correct me if I go astray a little bit. But because um, I think actually, Rodney, there's a lot of what you covered that touched on what we were sort of interested in learning more about. And so maybe that's 
a potential way we could sort of, you know, align our next sort of steps. And, you know, we've expressed this to you already, but uh, at our first meeting and through the, the two closed sessions we had, there's a lot of conversation about cumulative impacts and considering them and, and how they're considered. And it's a, you know, that in itself is a pretty complicated, has different layers. And so I think we can use that to sort of tie in a couple of things. So one could be on how are cumulative impacts considered in the leasing process, determining wind energy areas. So after you determine one is a wind energy area, do you consider cumulative impacts and how do you consider that in determining the next wind energy area? So I think it's on the siting question of the areas themselves, how do you build that in? It ties directly into the long-term monitoring question. You know, what's the kinds of data you're collecting now to inform assessments of cumulative impacts? And I should be clear, cumulative impacts kind of has a very negative connotation, but it could also be cumulative impacts on a positive side, right? It doesn't always have to be negative. So what's the kind of long-term monitoring efforts? And maybe Rodney, how does that feed into your innovative ocean monitoring activities and is there something we could work with you on how you define that and think about that but obviously to be able to measure cumulative impacts we have to have the long-term monitoring in place and how much of that falls within BOEM or NOAA or NSF or how do we think about that whole process the other piece that this ties into what we've been talking about is compensation funds right compensation is all about expected damages and that is not just independent one-time expected damage, that's the expected future damages associated with a particular activity, which itself is a function of cumulative impacts, not just one site itself. So how do we thinking about when we're designing these compensation funds, this idea of cumulative impacts and how is that into that process? And then finally, the question that keeps coming up uh, is authority. How do we think about cumulative impacts within the authority that BOEM has? And how do you guys think about that when obviously this goes way beyond you? Um, and so we could, for example, use that to touch on a lot of the, the issues that we have raised, I think. I'm seeing some nods. No one's throwing anything at me right now. <laughs> so that's great. But you know, that could be a way to structure our next sets of conversations. It could, and it could be that we have an afternoon session on one piece of that. Uh, but a way to sort of integrate it. And so before opening it up to the public, I'm just going to let the committee members respond or add to what I said, or uh, well, say whatever you want to say uh, <laughs> with regards to that. Good job. <laughs> Since good, it seems like you touched our issues. Okay, so that's something for you guys maybe to consider. We could have additional conversations on that. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to the experts on how to handle this next <laughs> part of it. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, public uh, participants, uh, or attendees, as Zoom as calls you, uh, you have the ability to raise your hand and um, I will go through it and call on people. Um, please address your comments um, to the committee. We are seeking to hear from you as stakeholders, as the general public, um, to see what's important, um, what you think the, the standing committee should tackle in future meetings. So first I will go to um, Timothy Sipple. So should we have them introduce themselves? Wait. Yeah, yes, Wait. please. Um, when uh, you start speaking, uh, say your name uh, briefly, what sector or industry you're from um, and uh, area of the country and kind of what your interest in the topic is uh, and then uh, pr present your question or comment. Mm -hmm. and, Timothy, you have uh, the floor. Uh, hello, this is Tim Sipple. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Tim Sipple, I am an, uh, an environmental scientist working for a consultancy named Abyssian. And I'm, uh, I work, uh, our, our company, and I work in a group that focuses heavily on offshore wind development and advising um, developers on the process ranging from permit, permitting to environmental impacts. Um, I'm a fishery specialist. I, <clears throat> before this role, I worked for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as a salmon fishery manager in the Columbia River. Before that, I was at um, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, in uh, La Jolla 
um, as a stock assessment scientist and also um, on the Pacific Fishery Management Council's Highly Migratory Species Management Committee. So I've been engaged in fishery management for quite a while and bringing all this to the table on offshore wind. Um, the question I typed into the, <clears throat> into the field here pertains to consideration of <clears throat> the impacts of displacing, displacing U.S. seafood production um, out, out of our uh, production capacity into overseas markets as a result of displacing them um, from offshore wind development. Um, our fisheries are amongst the most well-managed and, and closely monitored fisheries in the world. Um, we have a, as good of a handle as anybody on the impacts of our fisheries and monitoring the sustainability through our scientific-based approach. And many other countries don't um, follow um, standards similar, similar to that. So the effect of displacing our fisheries could potentially be the effect of um, uh, moving production overseas to places that have higher impacts. Likewise, um, seafood is one of the lower um, carbon footprint animal protein sources relative to um, uh, factory farm, uh, beef and pork and chicken, things like that. So if we drive um, consumers you know, away from seafood into those higher impacts, then we're actually having a, you know, a not desirable impact on carbon footprint. So I'm just um, wondering how all of this is considered in the process of prioritizing uh, the process. Um, that's kind of we're trying. We're you know we have competing objectives here, and I guess primarily I want to kind of raise these points to make sure that they are being considered and talked about. And the last element of that is um, you know there there was a mention of the <clears throat> compensation agreements through bidding credits and community benefit agreements. The the assumption of that seems to be that there will be a negative impact that's somehow being um, accounted for or compensated for. Um, but if we were to take a more collaborative approach, try to find ways to get um, the two industries, offshore wind and fisheries, to actually work collaboratively, um, we could be thinking about how to get a win-win situation as opposed to one industry compensating another for undesirable impacts. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. This is Jim St. Kirk. I just, uh, I just also want to set expectations. We're not expecting BOEM or committee members to answer some of the questions you're posing. We think that, I mean, we appreciate you asking them, but they will go into our record, and then we will be considering that as we develop additional topics for future meetings, right? I just want to make sure that everyone has the same expectation. Uh, on what we're we're trying to get from this process. So thank you very much for raising those issues. Um, do we have someone else? Okay, next, I will jump to um, Mike, and I'm 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 not going to try to butcher your last name. I just gave you permission to speak um, from the Pacific Seafood. Just call him um, Mike. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Mike o is just fine. I'm not technically working for Pacific Seafood anymore, but I am representing an environmental uh, fishery group, I guess you could call it too, on uh, West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group. I've been in the industry 53 years. Um, I started working on MAFAC with learning about offshore wind energy and what it looked like or portended for fisheries. I the last gentleman really nailed it, I thought, um, up until the CBA stuff. I, I have uh, no desire to put out or see any uh, type of compensation program put together until they understand the total dynamics and value of the fishery and how many jobs there are in that. And I may be off base here a little bit, but I read a one NOAA report, it was $178 billion and I think 1.3 million jobs in one of the reports. So it's also a food security issue. The last gentleman just pointed it out well. For every job and manufacturing thing we put overseas or food source that we pursue overseas or buy overseas, we're giving work to people that use a lot more carbon than we do to produce what we get. 
and then they ship it overseas on big ships, which also does the same. I can't see why food being so important as a basic need for life is being just tossed, not even talked about. And it, it really disturbs a lot of us. I'm also on the ROTA board. I'm on the Marine Planning Committee for the Council, the Groundfish Advisory Panel, and the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Panel. So I've been doing that uh, the work with the Pacific Council at sub-panel levels for the last 20-some years. But as a gentleman who was on the council said, who started out thinking we shouldn't get involved in offshore wind, it's the biggest threat to the fisheries he's ever seen since he got on the council and he got on when it was first formed. So he, he's a guy that is very well respected and has done a lot of different fisheries. So what I'm hearing from Bohm is the same latitudes we've heard for the last five years. And uh, yeah, we wanna do good, we wanna help out. But the truth of the matter is, if you displace fisheries, you're gonna lose them. There's just a certain tipping point where processors can no longer have enough fish to keep doing business. And it's all balanced, the whole supply chain. And, and nobody's looking at any of this, these impacts at this point. Yeah, it's supposed to happen after we get to a point where we're gonna uh, you know, start construction or ready to start construction. By that time, there's gonna be quite a few people that have dropped out of the industry and probably have nothing to show for it. Uh, the mitigation is ridiculous of what they're planning on doing for compensation. If you put the whole $178 billion into it, maybe you can find a way to buy out the fishery. But guess what? That's every year. These fishermen are in it for the long haul, most of them, not, not just to get out and retire. So what I'm hearing today, uh, I just hope the members of the standing committee will heed some of the information that's been put out here today and not just listen to the bone. Because it, it's, it's, I mean, it's not that I dislike the people from Bone. I made a few good friends there, but the message and just the whole attitude about not needing to do this research and the other stuff on the environment is, is just absurd. Uh, you need to do it up front and before you start the projects. Not after, not after you're ready to uh, start building and stuff. By that point, how many of them are going to be uh, re reversed? Probably not. And I'll be quiet after that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next, we will go to Leah H. And you should. Uh... Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Oh, am I muted? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. I just got a pop up that said the host muted me. Apologize. Uh, things are That's moving around. <laughs> Re -muting no worries. People. No worries at all. Um, thanks, Caroline, and and thanks to the folks who. Um, Thanks to the to the committee members and and the folks who helped set up um, these meetings over the last um, two days. They've been very informative. Um, my name is Lee Habegger. I'm the executive director of Seafood Harvesters of America. We are a national commercial fishing association representing fishermen from every corner of the country, Alaska to Hawaii to Florida to Maine. Um, I am interested in this committee working to bring some increased transparency to BOEM's process in handling public comment and feedback. Over the last three years, the commercial fishing industry has submitted formal comments and informal comments um, in a variety of ways, and we have seen very few of these comments and recommendations incorporated into various projects and or processes at BOEM. Um, the lack of response by BOEM to our comments and concerns has been extremely frustrating, especially when, as you all continue to hear from the, the fishing industry and others, um, that offshore industrialization threatens our national food security, decades old fishing businesses, and our coastal communities. So um, I think from a national commercial fishing perspective, we would really like to see some transparency um, in BOEM's processes. And I think 
this committee stands um, in a great place to be able to um, look at those processes and help educate um, the at least the commercial fishing industry, help us um, be more productive partners here because it's been, um, it feels very one-sided. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Um, Steve, do you want to, so it seems like we have a lull in the public comment. Do you want to come back and ask the question or at least get your co comments registered? Sure. So I, I passed on my question earlier to, to make sure we had public input time. Um, but it was, it was in response to the presentation that Jill gave. There was a, a circular process diagram that showed uh, stakeholder engagement kind of stuck in the middle. And so this is kind of more of a comment that I think echoes the, the, the last speaker and some of the other things the committee's already heard is that that's too late in the process is, is kind of my take on what a lot of people are, are trying to convey. And I appreciated that, you know, Jill, when you gave the presentation, you actually clarified that that's not representative of how you actually engage stakeholders throughout. So I, I was curious if you could just talk a little bit more about the stakeholder engagement elements of the other parts of the figure. And then maybe a suggestion is that, you know, maybe that figure needs some revision to clarify that and communicate it, because I think it's pretty important. Um, so that, that was it. And I had a short follow-up question after that. Okay. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, it, it just struck me too when I was actually presenting it. I was like, oh, we re we need to fix that because that's not really represent. Doesn't really represent. It might represent where it sits in a formal NEPA process, but it doesn't represent, uh, you know, regional um, entities that have been set up in stakeholder interactions to to develop the wind energy areas, as well as things like that that happen at a project level. Um, some of the tribal engagement, the um, for the environmental justice engagement that we've been working on, particularly, for example, with the New York by leases. So um, stakeholder engagement is a key part that happens from before when energy areas developed all the way through through the process. Um, I think there's a lot of stakeholders, right? There's a lot of stakeholders with different um input different um opinions and and so it's it's a challenging thing but uh, it, it, yeah i just want to reinforce that it does happen early and often it may not uh feel exactly right to everybody <laughs> and we always look for input on ways that we can improve that and if that's something we can you know incorporate we we definitely will do that but we are trying our best to to get out there and provide forms for people to to provide input where we can hear other things, where we can share information, and um, and where we can listen. Thank you. Um, so, a second follow up question was: um, I, I personally wasn't aware how much social science expertise it sounds like you you all have within within house. Do you have numbers on that? If there's a couple hundred scientists overall, how many are sociologists, <laughs> anthropologists, economists versus you know natural scientists? Um, I don't know if we have an exact number. I know the hundreds we're talking about include engineers. So it includes not just the environmental program, but it includes other aspects of BOEM. If I looked at our little microcosm in the Office of Environmental Programs, where we have, uh, you know, 50, low 50s, um, and that's just for OEP, right? There's there's folks out in the regions as well. Um, I would say... Um, some of those 50 are just for business processes, right? To keep us up and running and moving. So if we get down from there, we're probably down to 35 or so of them that are actual sort of ologists or technical experts um, in the human or physical or biology field. And I would say uh, probably maybe not a third, but close to a third have some sort of econ sociology background and we are looking to sort of build that. Uh, we do have folks who are interdisciplinary as well. So who have done uh, work and, and or education that tries to pull together, 
you know, a social aspect with maybe a biological aspect. So we, we don't necessarily always have people that are just in one subject, one area. Um, but I know I have like 12 active people in my assessment group and, um, you know, you know, three to four of them are working just environmental justice issues or sociology issues. And I think, uh, you know, Rodney, your group is probably comparable to that. Yeah, I, I would say my group is comparable with the addition of one, and because that's me, because I'm a sociologist. That's true, right? <laughs> Rodney is a sociologist. Yeah, right? yeah. And environmental sociologist. But yeah, so I don't you know. I think it's about right. We also, um, you know, have uh, Joe. You you, you can mention this in a sense, but we have an economics division that focuses kind of on the yes. economic aspects. But then we kind of have socioeconomists that kind of look at more uh, regional. Uh, regional, you know, economic impact assessment aspects and social impact uh, impact assessments, and then of course there's uh, folks that will focus more on your anthropology, social cultural ethnography, yeah. and uh, then there's the, the cultural uh, archaeologist that will focus on uh, the marine archaeology itself, but also the cultural aspects of that. So, and um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, I want to, as we're getting closer to five o'clock, uh, I just wanted to offer up and see if there's anyone else um, um, that's attending the meeting virtually that would like to um, share any comments or questions with the committee. Um, I'll give it a, a minute or so for people to raise their hands. It's Seeing no hands, but I do also want to thank everybody that has made uh, put questions or comments into the Q and A feature. Um, I've been trying to answer some of those and and ones from yesterday. Um, that uh, uh, I will take make sure that the committee members see um, questions and, and and comments from the public, um, and we will talk about them. Uh, as a committee in future closed sessions as we go through and look at planning for our um, next open sessions. Any final comments from committee members? So I'll just make one final comment. Thank you to all the committee members for taking this time out of your busy schedules to come. It has been very informative and thank Bohm. Uh, for sponsoring us in the academies and all the academy staff. And uh, I want all the committee members to know that you are being given back 13 minutes of time that we will, I'm sure, utilize at another point. So I'm sure. Uh, yes. Thank you so very we much. We owe you 13 minutes now, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. So Thank you all that adjourned our uh, spring meeting of the um, standing committee on offshore wind energy and fisheries. Really appreciate, want to echo um, Jim's comments. Really appreciate all the speakers from BOEM, the public for um, listening and participating, and uh, for the committee members for traveling. It was great to have uh, everyone that could travel here in person um, and looking forward to continued work of this committee. 